This is Open to Hope Radio, featuring Dr. Gloria Horsley and her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley, coming to you on behalf of the Open to Hope Foundation, dedicated to those who are looking for hope after loss. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show in partnership with the Compassionate Friends. I'm your host, Dr. Heidi Horsley, with my co-host and mother, Dr. Gloria Horsley. Hi, Mom. Hi, Heidi. You know, we're going to have a, a really interesting guest today because she has a lot of similarities with us because she lost a 15-year-old daughter in an automobile accident, and Scott was 17. And she is going to talk to a little bit today about living in a wellness universe. She's had a husband who's had a stroke, and... Uh, She's still, man, she's upbeat, and uh, she's going to really give us some ideas and thoughts about things that we can do, right, Hyde? Absolutely, Mom. Like you said, our guest today has a lot in common with us. She is all about collaboration and bringing together those of us who have had adversity in our lives and finding hope again. And she is, she not only talks the talk, but she walks the walk. And we're going to be talking with her about living in a wellness universe. Linda Sheldon Fell is the, crea- is the creator of Grief Diaries, brand of books, webinars, radio, and film, executive director of the National Grief and Hope Convention, and president of the newly formed National Grief and Hope Coalition. Chosen as this year's inspirational speaker for Camp Fire organization, she received a standing ovation to her speech on overcoming loss. Welcome to the show, Linda. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's honored to be here. There's silver linings in everything, and one of my own silver linings from our own tragedy is that it's created this whole new life for me Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have had prior to our loss. And it's been one that has personally enriched my own life beyond measure. You know, it's, it's such a, um, a bittersweet, uh, it's a blessing. There's many things that uh, you know, that have come from it that wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, but it's still for any loss, you know, you would give it all back again just for five minutes with your loved one, you know. It, right. it, it's, it's such a catch-22. Talk uh, talk a little bit about your grief journey. Uh, She's uh, our third out of four children, and she was built a little bit differently. Uh, she was a competitive athlete from a very young age, and a 4.0 student, and she had set her sights by the time she was in seventh grade on attending Stanford and making it to the Olympics. Wow. And she was well on her way. And by the time she, she practiced year round, she was a USA sanctioned swimmer and a, wow. a senior swimmer. And uh, she started out being a, a, a gymnast. And by age nine, she was state beam champ. And then she suffered this terrible, terrible fall off the, uh, the uneven bars and broke her arm in three spots, dislocated it in two spots. And, and so it was going to take three years to fully heal. And she was rehabbing her arm and watching the Olympics on TV that summer. And she saw swimming and she said, Mama, that's that's what I want to do. And I thought, swimming? Ugh. She didn't really even know how to swim. It, long story short. I took her to a, a local team, and the coach said, this is an athlete. I'll take her. And within a couple <laughs> of years, she was setting records, and a freshman in high school, she broke three records and made it to state and uh, was uh, really, um, she was very goals, you know, driven and and. Uh, just very dedicated, and and it was really, you know, we just tried to keep up with her. And uh, so she was at the, the pool at 5 a.m. every morning for two hours, go to school, go back to the pool for two hours. And, uh, and, and so one August, when the U.S. Open was being held in Seattle, her coach told her, I want you to go watch Michael Phelps. This is a qualifying mm-hmm. meet. Oh, wow. And I want you to go. This is good training for you. And so the kids got up, the, the, just a handful of the senior swimmers, they got up that morning to uh, practice, of course. And then off they went. And I didn't, Allie and I were inseparable. You know, I, I volunteered at all the meets and I served on the board. And it was a large swim team. And, and I, we had a board meeting that afternoon. So I did not go. And 
it was the one time that I wasn't with her. And they had been up 18 hours. They were on the last leg home, dropped off a few kids, and it was dark. The driver didn't know the road, and he missed a stop sign. And Mm -hmm. their car was T-boned by a father coming home from work in his work truck. And he hit right where Allie was, and she died instantly. And uh, she was the only fatality. And the driver is a lovely, lovely, now young man. And uh, he was just entering his senior year of high school. And we held them very close to our family because we knew a lot of people would probably, you know, teenage driver, throw them under the bus, that kind of thing. And he did nothing wrong. Uh, it was just dark and late and, you know, just he, he, great kid, great kid. And uh, so we faced what everyone considers, you know, a parent's worst nightmare. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting about grief because it's not like you learn about grief in school. It's not like you get immunized against grief. It's something you really don't have much interaction with until you are on your own very first baby steps of your own journey. And so that is when my life turned around. Completely well, different direction. I've got to say something about Allie. This is a kid that sounds like she lived such a full life in 15 years and she was did. so internally <laughs> driven. I mean, most kids aren't like this and just almost no. lived it to the, the fullest at uh, 300%. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, uh, out of the four kids, she was the only one like that. And mm-hmm. our oldest was a cheerleader, classic cheerleader. Uh, next one was in baseball, the youngest is musician and in physics. So all of our kids, we believe in supporting our children, their individual dreams. And as hard as that can be in terms of driving your children around and such, you know, every child is unique. Right. And it's our job to support their endeavors. And Allie was no exception. Mm-hmm. And you know, many mornings, my husband would say, oh, Pooh Bear, please, can I sleep in? No, mm-hmm. Daddy. I am impressed with your level of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And Heidi and I do a lot of presenting, and we meet a lot of angry people who are very angry at the people who were driving the car. And the thing about it is that it is such an impediment for those people over the years. We meet people that are it angry. Is. You know, 10 yeah. years later, and and their anger is, is blocking them. And you know what's interesting about that is, you know, when the accident happened, the driver, his name's Donovan, and he and Allie, Allie just really greatly admired him. He was three years older. He was a leader. He and Allie were the two butterfly strokers, uh, powerhouses, and... When the accident happened, I just in my shock and my fog, I instinctively knew that people would be throwing him under the bus. Mm -hmm. And so our whole family, you know, the mother is often the one in the family to set the tone. And I set that tone and my children and, you know, there, there was people ask me, well, how did you forgive Donovan? There was no need to forgive him. There was no forgiveness needed. Donovan's parents and his grandmother, they all, his grandmother from Reno, they flew up here, of course. And she was sitting next to me out on the front patio at one point. And I, I have very few memories from this time, as shock does to you. But yes, she reached sure. over and patted my leg, and she looked me in the eye, and she said, thank you. And what I learned was that her father, so this goes back a, a, a you know a couple generations, her father, when he was 17, he killed somebody. He was a driver, oh and gosh. the town absolutely ostracized him. He was raked over the coals and the family was shunned from thereafter. And I didn't know that, of course, until she she thanked me and it came from the heart and I could see it in her eyes. And that really touched a nerve in me on, oh my gosh, you know, through our own accident and our love for Donovan, not, you know, this poor boy, 
was it the will? I mean, he has to live with this as a life sentence. You talk about some ways of offering hope to the bereaved. What, what do you think the bereaved need in early grief? Well, what I needed is what I received, and that is a, another reason why I'm on this path to offer comfort, company, and hope to others. It's because I was gifted with so much support and love from not only my family, but my community and from so many people. And I I discovered very early on in my own journey that many bereaved people do not have that same level of support. And that really touched me. And I vowed to make a difference just right with that. I, I didn't know how. I didn't know what way I would even begin for. I needed to walk my own journey for quite a while first. And uh, but that's that's that was a pivotal moment for me because many people don't have that support, and so I decided, you know, I was going to go find those people that didn't have support. Many people are not validated in their grief, and in my mind, that's the very first step toward healing is being validated. And so I found myself becoming a voice for the bereaved, and it wasn't intentionally at first, but it grew. And mm-hmm. I decided to start a radio show to let, let's let's talk about it. And, you know, people could openly share and be candid about their journey. And it wasn't a place to, you know, wallow in self-pity. It wasn't a, a place to just sit and complain. It was just a, offering them that moment of validation. Yeah, this sucks. So where do mm-hmm. we go from here? And that's how I started. And, you know, now to give people hope, one of the, <laughs> one of the, the ways, and of course, um, you know, this, this is true for all of us, but it's in our own actions. And mm-hmm. I've heard it said before that the brief parent is the worst of the lot. Now, whether that's true or not, I can't say. I've not, I've not faced some of the other losses out there. Well, you know, I realized early in on my own journey within just a couple of months that I was starting to get ill frequently. And, you know, when you are facing profound loss, your body's in that perpetual fight or flight syndrome and your adrenaline's going constantly. And that's very hard on your system and it compromises your own immunity. And to practice, you know, good sleep hygiene uh, healthful eating, and I know it's easier said than done, but it's very important because if you physically feel better, your coping skills are stronger, and that's really, really important. That's really important. And, and you know, one of the other things um, with regards to offering people hope, you know, I think it's really important for people to spend a few minutes every day just thinking compassionate thoughts about themselves. Mm, I like that. And... Mm-hmm. That that's really huge because we get caught up in caring for our spouse and our children and and everyone is at the top of the list ahead of ourselves. But it's really important to take care of ourselves because again, when we do that, our coping gets stronger and we're yep. able to handle and process what we're going through. I'm a big fan of people sharing their stories about their journeys, because when you share stories, it offers company to others in need, and it also helps you to feel not so alone, which is really important, and it helps you to feel like, oh, my gosh, I'm not the only one going through this, and I'm not crazy after all, and, you know, these thoughts are normal, and so I developed a series of books, and the first 10 titles are coming out here in just a couple of weeks, December 15th. And they're, each one is an anthology book about different kinds of losses. And it's really interesting because I've, now for this group of books, it's 108 participants in six countries. And it started this whole other group of books that will be starting in January. You know, there's other kinds of losses that I hadn't considered. And so it's really cool. It just this this whole grief diaries just keeps growing and growing, and it's become a really beautiful little village of people who just want to share stories and reach out and comfort one another. And so people can find more information about grief diaries 
by going to the website griefdiaries.com and to participate in future books, click on the uh, Join Our Book Project link, and it'll take you to the page. It explains it a little bit more, what titles we're opening up. The National Grief and Hope Coalition is a brand-new national nonprofit that will be fostering fellowship among all the organizations that serve the brief, as well as other uh, projects contained within that, one of which will be the National Grief and Hope Convention, which we hosted earlier this year, and the coalition will take over. And to learn more about that, they can go to helphealhope.org. And the website is in its infancy, and we're just getting going with it. But we look forward to developing some really cool programs, uh, you know, across the nation through it. And uh, people can get more information by going to helphealhope.org. Best wishes to uh, everything you're doing. If you've lost hope, lean on ours. And I think that's what this is all about, coming together to heal as a community and as a collective and leaning on people that are further along in their journey. Absolutely. And we want to thank everybody for listening to our show. And uh, we want to, again, as Heidi said, remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours till you find your own and visit us to, at opentohope.com. And God bless. You've been listening to Open to Hope Radio, hosted by Drs. Gloria and Heidi Horsley. Like today's edition, all of our past programs are available on demand at opentohope.com, along with helpful articles, videos, resources, and links to help get you through the toughest time of your life. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Again, that's opentohope.com. Check it out today. Then be sure to stop by next Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time when we'll be posting another edition of Open to Hope Radio. Remember, Others have been where you are. They made it through, and you can too, as long as you're open to hope.